Hello and welcome again. So this is a continuation of all the properties of number theory that we need for the public key cryptography algorithm or algorithms that we're going to see uh, later. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about in this, uh, in this video is this important theorem or fact of mathematics that's called the Euler's theorem. Now, this theorem has to do with a couple of things we already saw earlier which is the congruence. As you can see here, it has the three parallel lines that is congruent here. And also another important function, the function phi. Now remember, this function phi is the, fun uh, the function that gives me all the numbers from 0 to, in this case, will be n minus 1, that are relatively prime to n. Now, what the theorem says here, and this also this is actually the key property we're going to use for the RSA algorithm. Uh, this kind of congruence and the problem and the property uh, is like this. So suppose we have here an integer a. I don't need the integer b in this case. So I can erase it from there. So I have a, which is an integer. So I have an integer a. Any integer could do. And I have a natural number. So we're gonna use natural number just to keep it simple, in such a way that the greatest common divisor between these integers that I have here and the natural number n is equal to 1. So basically what I'm saying is they are relatively prime or another word to say is that a and n do not have any common factors. So if I have that integer a and the natural number n with no common factors, the Euler's theorem says that if I take a to the power of phi of n, where phi of n is the number that of the number of numbers that are relatively prime to n that are between 0 and n minus 1, if I take that power here, that's going to be congruent to 1 modulo n. Now, this n that is here is exactly the same n that is here. So, this is an important property we'll use later. Basically, what the property is saying is this. If you take this power here, you take a number a, which you have to make sure that the a and n do not have any common factors, because if they do, then this property is usually not true. So, if you take a to this power, this is going to give you a number. The remainder of that is going to give you just 1 when you divide it by n. So that's basically what the property is saying. Take this, uh, could, this could be a huge number. a to this power here, divide this by n, the remainder of that division will give you 1. So that's basically what the problem here is saying. So let's look at a particular example just to double check or to check that it's actually true for some numbers. What I'm going to show you here is not a proof, because a proof should work for all the numbers. What I'm going to show you is just an example that shows us that this is actually working. So the example here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take n to be 15. This is going to be my value of n, which is a natural number. And for a, I'm going to take 4. I could have taken, for example, another one, like negative 4 or something like that. Now, you have to make sure that these two numbers do not have any common factors. For example, if I choose 5, that's not a good choice to check this theorem because I need to have a and n to have no common factors. But in this case, they don't have common factors. You can actually check that the greatest common divisor between uh, 4 and 15 is actually 1. So 4 and 15, the greatest common factor is actually 1. Now remember, this is an important property to apply this theorem here. So what this theorem says, if I take this a to this power here, then that's going to give me congruent to 1 modulo n, and n in this case is 15. Now, first, to do this, I have to compute phi of n. So basically, what I want to do is I want to compute phi of 15. So let's compute phi of 15. So what is phi of 15? Now, remember, to do that, uh, to do it in a faster way, is uh, we're going to look at the uh, canonical descomposition of this number in primes. Now, I can write down 15 as uh, 3 times uh, 5. And from there, I can actually say what a phi of 15 is. So I'm going to just erase it here. And so what is phi of 15? Remember, what you do is every product that you have, every factor that you have here is going to produce a factor for phi of 15. So it's going to be, this is 3 to the first power, 5 to the first power, so it's going to give me 3 to the first power minus 3 to the 0 power. You subtract 1 from the exponent. And then the same we're going to do for 5. It's going to be 5 to the first power minus 
5 to the 0 power. So in this case, this is going to give me, uh, this is 3, the, the first one, the first factor is going to give me 3 minus 1, which is a 2. And I'm going to multiply, the second factor will give me 5 minus 1, which is a 4. So that's going to give me 8, uh, 4 here. And the whole thing, of course, is going to give me, this is going to give me 8. So that's phi of 15. So phi of 15 in this case is just number 8. So what the theorem says is take the number a that you have here, which in this case is 4, take it to the 8th power because that's phi of 15, the 8th power, and that should be congruent to 1 modulo n, and in this case is 15. So let's double check that. So a in this case is 4, so what I have to do is I have to take 4 to the phi of phi of 15, which is 8, so I have 8, and it has to be congruent to 1 modulo, modulo 15. Now, according to the theorem, this should be true, because uh, the greatest common divisor between 4 and 15 is 1, so this should be true here. So how can I check that this is true? One way to do it is just look at what is 4 to the 8. Now, 4 to the 8 here, uh, is actually equal to this number, uh, 65, 5, 3, 6. Now, how will I know that uh, this number that is here is congruent to 1 modulo 15? By definition, if that were to be the case, then 15 will have to divide 4 to the a, which is this number, minus 1. Now, is that true? So, is 15 a divisor of the number... 6, 5, 5, 3, 6, minus 1. Now, if you actually do that, you're going to find that that's the case. Now, this number that is here is, of course, 6, 5, 5, 3, 5. Now, that number is going to be divisible by 15. And you can check that with your calculator. So, this uh, theorem, this is just an example to show you that the theorem works. This theorem is going to be important later. We're going to use it. It's going to be a key part for the, uh, for the public key cryptography algorithm that we're going to see uh, later. So that's the Euler's theorem. So that's an example. And that is true. This theorem is true whenever a and n do not have any common factors. If they do, again, that's not, not necessarily true. Now let's look at another ex uh, theorem here, which is also important, which is Fermat's little theorem. Now you might have heard this Fermat uh, name before if you uh, maybe saw some news about the the last uh, Fermat theorem, but this is the little Fermat theorem. And what it says is this, it's a little bit similar to Euler's theorem. It says is, if I have an integer a, and now I have p, which is a prime number. Now in this case, a and p do not have to be relatively prime. So is any number a, any integer, and any prime p. What the theorem says is, if I take a to the p power, that's going to be congruent to a modulo the prime p. Notice that I still have here a power. It's not phi of n in this case, but it's just the power p, which is equal to this prime here. So basically what the theorem is saying is that if you take a to this p power and divide it by p, that's going to be your remainder, which is exactly the same as the remainder that you get when you take a and divide it by p. So that's basically what it says. So that's for math little theorem. So let's look at an example here and see how this works. So the example, let's say in this case I have a, which is 4. I can take any integer. In this case I'm going to take 4. And I'm, I have to take p, and this has to be a prime number. So what this theorem says here is that a to the p means a to the fifth power should be congruent to a modulo p. So let's double check that. So is a in this case is 4 to the p will be 5. That should be congruent to a, and a in this case is 4, modulo, modulo p. And modulo p here in this case is 5. Now, to double check that that's the case, the only thing you have to do is just go ahead and write down what 4 to the 5th power is. Now, let's see 4 to the 5th power. So, 4 to the 5th power, that's going to give you 10, 24. So, what this, uh, this is 5 here. Now, what this is saying is that 1024 is congruent to 4 modulo 5. So basically what we are saying is that 10, let me write it down over here, 
10, 24 is congruent to 4 modulo 5. And that is actually true because if you look at the definition of what this ex, uh, this statement here says, basically what it's saying is that 5 divides this number minus 4. And let's see why. Because 5 divides 10, 24 minus 4. And if you look at it, that you're going to get the divisibility because 10, 24 minus 4 is 10, 20. This whole number is 10, 20. It ends at 0, so it has to be divisible by 5. So the theorem is true. So that's the Fermat's little theorem. So it's a little bit similar to the um, Euler's theorem. The only difference here is that, that the power here is not phi of n, it's just the prime p, which is exactly this number here. Now, there is a consequence of Euler's theorem that is similar to little theorem and is like this. But we need an extra hypothesis, an extra requirement for, for the numbers a and p. So now I have this almost the same statement as before. So I have an integer a and I have a prime number here, which is, I'm going to consider that as a natural number. And in this case, I'm going to require that the numbers a and p don't have any common factors. That's what it says here. The GCD of this a and p is equal to 1. In other words, p does not divide a. That's also another way to say it. If that is the case, then in this case, a to the p minus 1 power, so this power here, this will be congruent to 1 modulo p. So again, what it says is, if I take this power here, then I divide it by p, the remainder should be 1. This is actually a consequence of the Euler's theorem because if you look at what is phi of p, phi of p is actually p minus 1. And let I want to um, let you think about that one. Why is that the case? What phi of p has to be p minus 1. So just write down the definition and you will find out that this is actually the case. So this is actually a particular case of Euler's theorem because this guy that is here is phi of p. Now remember Euler's theorem says that a to the phi of n is congruent to 1 modulo n. If you replace the n by p, that's exactly what you will get. So this is the particular case of Euler's theorem in case you have that a is a prime, sorry, p is a prime, and a is a number that doesn't have any common factors with p, or basically p does not divide a. Now, those are the theorems that are important in, uh, in number theory. They're very important in number theory, but we talked about them because they're important in what we're going to do later in public key, key cryptography or asymmetric cryptography. Now, I don't want to give you an example of this one because it's exactly the same as the other one. I'm going to stop the video here, and in the next video, we will actually see how to use this all the, all the number theory that we just learned in all these videos, how that is going to be applied to public key cryptography, and in particular, uh, one particular uh, algorithm that we will, we will see how to set it up in the next video where all these theorems will play a big role in that algorithm. So I'm going to stop the video now and I will see you in the next video.